Hey guys, Freaky Finance here. Last week we looked at ATCO Utility Play in Alberta. This week we're gonna go in Suncor. I've been meaning to do this one for a while. I first looked at this one on the channel back in August, I think mid-August. So we're gonna go through it today. I'm gonna go a little bit quicker through the background of it. So I'll link the video to the original video to Suncor below. So let's get to it. First, I want to say I still own Suncor. It's slightly up from when I got in. My average is at 17. Actually, after I made the video, it actually went back down even though oil started going. Still going up. So I bought more. So it's a fair size position. I also, for energy, I also have some Vermilion calls. Vermilion's, in my mind, riskier than Suncor is from a balance sheet perspective, but it should be leveraged to the price of oil and that gas. And for some reason, the price is still down. I want to say 70% from the 52 week high. <laughs> so, and yeah, whereas Suncor is, I mean, still down almost like 50% from their 52 week high or whatever. Vermilion has a lot of leverage priced in, so I figured I'd buy some calls, which also has leverage priced in. So, and for some reason, people are writing calls to me at, like, these are, this is a decent theta, theta, right? You're at 23 months out, but the implied volatility on is very small, so it's like, fine, I'll take it. But the spread on this is, because it's not very liquid, it's pretty high. But anyway, that's a riskier play. But if I wanted, I wanted some extra juice in the oil, I'm starting to look at that if these prices stay where they are at the commodity side. Um, what else? I also own some nat gas plays. So, so I do have some decent exposure to uh, the uh, nat gas market in Canada as well, in Alberta. So I own AAV and Birchcliff, which had a week last week in P2. Really, these things, if you remember my annual review, I was down 10% in all three of these nat gas plays. <laughs> and now, less than six weeks later, we're up a decent amount, right? I'm surprised AAV is actually kind of lagged, but P2 and Birchcliff have done really well, and Birchcliff especially this week. Um, I also picked up, because some of these, some prices are moving and some prices aren't, it's very strange right now. I also picked up uh, Nat Gas Services on the US side. So this is just, this is like a really small company, and uh, <laughs> so is AAV. But this is a really small company that just uh, rents out Nat Gas compressors to users, so that would be like your AAV and your to. So that wouldn't be their customers because this is in Texas. Anyway, I'm ranting about Nat Gas, but this is an interesting one as well that I just started going into. Though again, this one's not really leveraged to commodity price because it's not a producer. It just rents out the equipment <laughs> and makes money based on the horsepower of the rented out equipment. It's a pretty cool model and it has no debt. <laughs> anyway, let's go to back to Suncor. I wanted to just say that I have I own it so you guys know that. I talked about this map before. They have a pretty strong footprint across Canada. And they have some wind operations here, uh, offshore in London, St. John's, and refineries spread out as well. This this map is new, so this is really good because it's going to tie into Enbridge, which just reported earnings yesterday. Uh, today is February 13th, 2021. So you can see uh, how Suncor gets to market through pipelines. These are the pipelines currently used. You can see the express one down here, the Rocky Mountain. But one of the things I like about this map this for people's contacts because they'll hear like the Keystone Pipeline, oh no, and all that, right? And you really gotta, you gotta see how big these pipelines are. So like this one, this yellow one stands out, right? It looks pretty good, right? But you gotta remember this one only has 280 MBPD, right? And this is your traditional TransCan without the XL. That's 580. The XL more than doubles the capacity for that pipeline. And that's this one right here. And that's the one that's got axed <laughs> by a... Uh, the Joe Biden, and then you have the Enbridge main line, and just just for context, I just want to point out you can see that number. Look how big that number is compared to all these, right? Twenty six hundred. The next biggest is the Keystone XL, which is currently still proposed, <laughs> and that's so basically I'm trying to say the main line is critical to getting oil from Alberta to the rest of the world, but really to America. And you can see here on this line three, there's a kind of you keep hearing like those. People are like, they want to protect the Great Lakes, basically, the environmentalists. So there's kind of some traction there because there's a little tunnel here that bridges across. That's just something to keep in your back of your head when you're hearing these things in the news, what it really means and how it affects Suncor as well, right? Not just Enbridge. I'm going to do a video on Enbridge, obviously, in a bit here. So I just wanted to bring this up again so you have a benchmark to what we're looking for. You can see during normal times, uh, Suncor is a share repurchasing and dividend machine. Um, it still pays a dividend right now in the oil industry, which is very interesting, actually. It did cut it, but it still pays a decent yield. But you can see that FFO can go up to 
10.8 billion during normal times. And the production, just remember this number, 777 production. So if you remember Suncor, I talked really quick about uh, the integrated model. Basically, if you listen to anything about Suncor, I'll talk about the agility and flexibility. And this is what this means. It basically can take the base product and refine it. And you can see how they break up their FFO. 50% is refined. And basically, that's into gas and distillates. 90% of that, 50%. And then you have synthetic crude. And then you have your offshore. Importantly, I should mention Brent. Offshore is priced in Brent, not WTI or WCS or anything like that. <clears throat> All right. So let me go here again. I, I showed this last time as well. But I just want to point out the margins are far superior for the refined product than they are for the base product, usually. And you can see the offshore is pretty high. Then if you remember, offshore was the UK and St. John's. Break even for WTI is pretty interesting. So you can see at $25 a barrel, they cover their operating cost. $30 a barrel, they cover their operating cost while keeping their sustaining capital, so aka keeping their production constant. And then at 75 they can cover their dividend that they have right now, which is like 3.6% or something like that. So really... Other companies would be posting this, right? Because they don't pay a dividend. <laughs> so, face Suncor is pretty has a pretty low break even now that, and especially because WTI is on a rip, right? Since I want to say since November, really it's been aggressively going up, and this week was very exciting. I think where did we close? Uh, well, we're almost at sixty, <laughs> and Brent's at sixty-two. That's that's exciting. So those stocks should be higher than where they are right now, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> anyway, you can see production. Like I said, they averaged 777 in 2019. And this year, they averaged 695, so a, a decrease. They, that decrease was specifically in Q2. You can see it's ramped back up in Q4. We're almost back to where we were in production. So that's going to be important because I'm about to jump to the numbers, and uh, they're pretty interesting. So let's do the quarterly first. Yeah. So we can see still red because of the commodity price decline, right? we put the WTI down here just to reference. You can see that in prior Q4 2019, WTI recognized was at basically 57. And for Q4 2020, because these are lagging numbers, WTI was at 42, even though now it's technically at 58 or so. So that's something that, that's very important, right? You can see that decrease. So pretty much in line with the uh, decrease in revenues up here. So really, because production was held fairly constant, we can see the direct effect on the commodity prices for each line, which is pretty cool in my point of view. <laughs> so you can see declines across the board. Um, importantly, there are a lot less than the declines in Q2 where we had declines of 65% with a WTI recognized in the 20s or 28th or so. <laughs> so a little bit better. It's obviously not as good because WTI was still down. They only recognized it at 42 in the quarter. So what that means, you can see GMD down 1.9 billion. Um, I already noted the WTI. Uh, gov sorry, government. <laughs> Some core reacted and cut the SGA down 300 million year over year. So that's management reacted. I mentioned that on the Q2 call. That's what I liked about it. They weren't just going to keep not doing anything when the commodity price was crashing on them. This line's kind of sticky. It actually went up unfavorably. And you can see depreciation and impairments very volatile, mainly because impairment is very quarter to quarter. There's a lot of noise. So in Q4 2019, they impaired materially. And in Q4 2020, this had a little bit of impairments relative to last year's impairments in the quarter. So that's why down here you see that technically the better on the bottom line, but that's just because of the noise and the impairments. And that's a big item, right? Six billion dollars in a quarter, two billion dollars in a quarter. Overall, you can see the share price is still down quite a bit. Um, company is, in my mind, that's how I view it. It's about 31 billion dollars cheaper than it was. And on you can see that there is a decline in fundamentals because of commodity prices, right? Because it was at 42 during the quarter on average for Suncor. So that makes sense to me. They did write down, like I said, some of the assets. So you saw uh, tangible assets go down. For context, the net book value of PPP, PPE sorry, was at 72.6 versus 68.1. So that went down about 4.5 billion. That's really what this delta is. You can see bank indebtedness actually went up, but it's still small. So Suncor had a strong balance sheet going in. That's why it was important. That's why we bought it, where I bought it. And it still does. Though you can see that it did pick up some debt, about $4 billion. That's really that it had to, because CFO or cash flow was down. So they had to get the money to keep the capex going, to keep the production going from somewhere, right? So that's what they did. You can see CF or FFO was negative after capex. Not negative in general. <laughs> after capex it was for the quarter. Again, they're trying to keep their production steady. Share buyback, so government, government, <laughs> management to cut it. Um, total share buyback which is prudent in my mind at the time for COVID. And they slashed the dividend, also prudent during COVID. Gotta keep that cash tight. 
All right, metric wise, I've talked about this enough, kind of. I'm still a low cost producer. SGA percent of revenue looks worse because revenue is still slashed by 30%. Just for a whole number, you can see that total revenue declined from 9.5 billion to 6.6 .6 billion. So still a sizable decline. And again, we know that production was fairly constant. So we know that it's really due to the lower commodity price during the quarter over a quarter from 2019 to now, even though it started to come back. And I mean, if we're gonna look at Q1 2021 at these prices, it looks amazing, right? We're gonna start seeing these type of numbers again, <laughs> but we're still getting half the half the price. So that's, that's exciting to me. So annual, the same kind of story. But here, I want to point out you can see cash from operations getting smoked. Right, you're down about eight billion dollars. Now we're gonna go through a slide real quick, but this one mentions sensitivity. So for every dollar that Brent oil increases, they expect 250 million more in annual free cash flow, <laughs> which is pretty sick because Brent. Well, I'll talk about that in a second, but they basically, they for the quarter, they, they might have averaged uh, like 41.65 for Q4 or for the year. And now Brent's at like 62. So you go at Delta, rough average it, and you go like, I don't know, 20.35 times 250 million. Uh, you're getting, I say, 5 billion more in free cash flow. So you're getting this number closing to this number right oh, pretty quick, right? Just on the current commodity prices, I don't think. Either the market doesn't believe that that's sustainable to current WTI prices or something's going on, right? <clears throat> because these producers have a lot of leverage to these commodity prices. Nothing new here. On an annual basis, you can see just how hurt the commodity prices were. You can see that in 2019, they're averaging 57, and during 2020, they were averaging under 40. And they were still able to etch out CFO. It, it didn't cover their capex, but they're still able, able to get out some cash flow from operations, which is commendable in that kind of <laughs> year. <laughs> so given where the current price of oil is, I'd argue that there's a material mispricing in Suncor. In my mind, it should be closer to 30 at least. I'm surprised it's still lingering down here. It's basically like the market doesn't view that in the current oil price, right? Maybe they think OPEC's about to come out and do another less reduction in production. Another view could be institutions don't want to touch oil and gas companies, given, like, if you did, you probably got fired <laughs> in the last 10 years. Um, it's been pretty bad in the energy sector for a while. But I still view, like, you can see the CapEx decline right here, right? Suncor went from $5.5 billion putting into the company to $3.9 billion. So that's a decline of $1.5 billion. But the thing is, a lot of companies have done this, right, to stay alive. So you're going to see there's a lot less production online in the future. At least that's what I'm thinking, and that's probably why the price is moving like it has been lately. So that's again conjecture. <clears throat> Basically, on the call, they mentioned that they're not going to be increasing capex more than what their current guidance is, despite the high oil prices right now. That was specifically on March third, or sorry, March February third, or something like that. So that's important to keep in your mind. I'm going to go through that in a second. Let's go back to the slides. So their capex, like I already talked about, 1.5 billion less. Importantly, though, their production profile stayed very constant so it very very much was uh, sustaining capex which is nice to see you can see how they split it out right 2.7 billion in oil sands so that's their capex heavy area but i thought i'd just mention that on their guidance side here's their ffo sensitivity one dollar brent equals 250 million in free cash flow so based at current prices of 62.43 for brent and we know the uh the average for 2020 was only 41.65. You take the delta, you just maybe just say 20, 20 dollars a barrel times 250 million, <laughs> and you get that five billion extra free cash flow, right? So that's nice. Anyway, this if you're ever going through the reports, I love this slide or this page, page 15 of the quarterly. It just breaks down everything year over year, and this one breaks it quarterly trend, which is very nice as well. On page 36. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about uh, on any of my videos yet is the crack spreads. Um, this is also important. It's important for Sonovus and the Huskies now as well, that they're together for refinery. So keep that in your back of your head that this is this one still has a ways to go back up, whereas W T I is already starting to come. Like you can see that W T I they only realized forty two sixty five, but we know that W T I is currently at fifty nine. <laughs> So it spiked since these numbers, right? And for some reason, the share price hasn't, which tells me that the market probably doesn't believe that it's sustainable at this level. But we'll see. But yeah, these, this is very interesting to me, just to see the trend over time. And then uh, just for context here, you can see the uh, 
June 2020 numbers very uh just how how deep that crash was during that quarter of Q2 so I'm, I'm always going to keep this tab just to remind myself just how how bleak that was for a lot of oil and gas companies during the Q2 COVID panic right it wasn't just a panic for them this was a real like commodity crash <laughs> can you imagine just a one quarter your revenues going down by two thirds <laughs> yeah. but yeah because for context, this quarter, 10 billion. This quarter, 4.2 billion. <laughs> so that's really crazy on a year-over-year comparison. And that's what I what I liked then is why I bought in then, was because they're reacting. They slashed their SGA. They slashed their capex. They slashed their share buybacks, and they reduced the dividend. They did everything they were supposed to. And so, I, yeah, that's that's the one I want to ride on the way up. That's safer, right? Because it had a decent balance sheet going in. So that's why I like Suncor. Here on the call, so they read it. He says, I just wanted to look at the word reiterate. So I searched it. I remember him saying it over and over again. So this is the CFO reiterating CEO Mark Little's comment. Basically, they're saying they're not going to increase their capital guidance range with the higher commodity prices. Because on the call, and now, commodity prices are quite high, right? So they're like, oh, well, are you going to keep spending more money then? And then start increasing production. They said no. And they said no again. And they said no again. <laughs> and then here, they kind of tell us what they're planning to do with the extra cash. Because, so like I said, now at current prices, they're not thinking about sustaining. They're thinking about thriving again and returning shareholder value. So you can see here, they're going to start paying debt, and they're going to start doing share buybacks again. So if the share price best stay, if the share price stays where it is down here, they're going to get a lot of bang for their buck on these share buybacks. So I'm not, I'm not ex expecting this share price to rally like crazy. But over time, if it doesn't, the company is going to be able to take quite a lot of the business back. I mean, for context here, this one, you can see that they uh, literally bought back 5.2 billion in shares in two years when WTI was around these prices that they're at now. So let's just say 2 billion a year. And if the market cap stays where it is or in the 32s or so, you're basically buying two 32s at the company every year, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. So I don't expect that to. <laughs> I don't expect that to stay like that forever. But anyway, basically, even though client viruses are going up lately, they're still doing a two to one split. So, or two thirds to debt and one third to share buybacks. So that's what we'll expect with the extra cash at these prices, assuming they stay here, right? For all we know, they're just gonna crash tomorrow or something. <laughs> I want. I thought this was interesting on whale wisdom, just to see the sector exposure of all the uh, 13S filers. So all the funds and money managers, uh, longs only. And you can see the uh, energy just dwindle out, right? So this is one of the cycle peaks, 2008. Yeah, another cycle peak in 2011 so you get as high as about just under 13 percent and then steady 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 under investment no one wants to touch energy anymore and that's what i like so when consensus says there's nothing energy is dead <laughs> that's when i'm like okay we're probably gonna get one last big one last big cycle before we really do go more renewable or when we actually can i know we want to but here's a there's a different thing between being what we want and what we actually have to do. <laughs> uh, so anyway, <clears throat> I thought it was interesting that the prayer price is still down here. That's why I bought some of those vermilion calls because someone's selling them way too cheap for me. There's like almost like there's no implied volatility. Like the Vega must be like <laughs> so small, even though oil's just been ripping, and the sh I know the share price has barely moved. So I'm like, well, maybe, maybe I'm the guy who's gonna lose on that one. But I mean, I got. 23 months for the share price to go above seven. <laughs> but anyway, for Suncor, WTI has just ripped, right? And Suncor's share price has legged him. So I think it's still an opportunity here. I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe there's OPEC says, nope, we're going to just ramp up production, keep the prices low so inflation doesn't get too out of hand. You never know, right? So a lot of people don't touch energy because they view the upside is capped by OPEC, right? It's manipulated. So that's why they don't touch it. But yeah, based on current information, now current quantity prices, Suncor looks like a steal. But who knows? <laughs> Maybe I'll dip back down here again and I can buy more <laughs> and average in. But yeah, anyway, I'd like to know your thoughts on Suncor. And uh, have a great weekend. I'm probably going to do a couple videos this week. I'm not sure. I did, I'd probably do the Embridge one as well. But yeah, anyway, take care. See you guys.